the Lord smile upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Amen. energy is in this room right now. How much of it? Well, I, I, it, it just, you can feel it. And it's exciting. Um, it's not the first time I felt a lot of energy or being around people, women and sisters journey. You're amazing. And uh, it's just powerful in here. If we could can this right now and go down to Washington, we could change the world. talk about some basic issues about our health as women. And there's a young woman sitting at our table, and I said, wow, how exciting for you. Because all the people at our table had all these ideas and we're talking about, we're not going to let barriers stop us. You know, we're going to, when there's something that's wrong, right? Denial of coverage, screening, ultrasounds, whatever it is, we're not going to take no when it comes to women's health. Because at the end of the day, if we don't take care of ourselves, who's going to take care of us, right? And we need to teach our, I don't have a daughter, but we need to teach our daughters that and to start young. And so I'm going to start off with talking about teaching our daughters with one of our speakers. Um, Claire Healy is going to talk about genetics. That has to do with family, okay? But before that, we're going to talk to um, Betsy who's the president of Get In Touch Foundation. I'm going to bring the microphone over to you. So if we're talking about teaching our children to take care of themselves and their health, what they eat, did we have great food today? Thanks to whoever decided on the menu. <laughs> when we teach them self-respect, that women should have self-respect starting when we're young, to believe in ourselves, they will say no when we have to say no. And that means, of course, because we're here about breast health. And so this young lady's going to tell you about something really that's exciting that she's, she and her mother have touched women and men because we have to teach them too. Sorry. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me today. Just going off of you, those amazing words. I can feel the energy here today, and I'm just empowered and inspired by your strength and just every everything that you are doing here to support Sister's Journey. So my story is, I my name is Betsy, and I'm the daughter of Marianne Wassel. And my mom, Marianne, when I was just 13 years old, and now I'm 31, when, when I was 13, my mom went to the doctor because she found a lump on her breast. And the doctor was very dismissive and was like, oh, don't worry about it. Come back in a year. It's probably nothing. And he was like eating a sandwich when he was telling her this. Yes, she did, never forgot that. And my mom did not like that. So she got a second opinion and found out she had breast cancer in both breasts. So it was a good thing she didn't wait an entire year to be seen. And at that time, I was 13, and my sister was 12, and she realized that she wanted us to learn how to do breast self-exam just like she was. She, she had, you know, grown up doing and was informed and strong. And when she went to my school nurse, said, hey, can you get that program in school that teaches breast self-exams and teaches young girls how to do them at a young age, you know, to, you know, carry through life? And the school nurse looked at her like she had two heads and was like, oh, there's no program that teaches that in schools. So she took matters into her own hands and realized this is something everybody should have access to. So she worked with an, a, an amazing medical advisory board with so many of the shakers and movers that our table had in common and created the Daisy Wheel. This is the tool that everybody you know, received in one of the bags. And it teaches the eight steps on how to do a breast self-exam in a very friendly, approachable way. So the first step is think of your breast as a daisy. So now I also dare you to look at a daisy now and not think of your breasts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, my mom's mission was to make sure that this was provided to school nurses and health educators completely free of cost. So the work that we do and the work that I do today is to make sure that we get this in the hands of all the people that need it. And today we have reached over 1.1 million students all over the world.
and it's because of the work that you know, my mom did and my mom started and the, the power of education. And unfortunately, my mom passed away six years ago um, after a stage four metastatic breast cancer recurrence. And that's when I stepped into her position to lead this organization. And uh, I am proud to be here today carrying on her life-giving mission legacy. I feel like, Dawn, we <laughs> share so much um, in you know, carrying on a very powerful mission and legacy. And so I'm here today to just pre preach on behalf of my mom and say that breast health is important. And teaching girls how to do a breast health exam at a young age is important because isn't knowing your body so powerful? Especially at a young age and knowing your baseline. So that's, that's a little bit about me and the work that I do today. So all of you have um, the daisy wheel in your bag. The question I want to pose to her is if you're in an organization, you're a church organization, a sorority, women at work, how can you get more of those? How can you access that? For the women you know, and the other women you think that they need to be before. So I'm going to ask you that question. Well, first of all, you can you know, find me and we can make sure we get these to you if you need them. Um, but we also do have a mobile app. So on our website, if you go to our website um, or any of our social media pages, if you, you can find the Daisy Wheel app. It's completely free. It teaches you the eight steps of a breast cell exam. And you can set a reminder. So we get that everyone has very busy lives. So if you want to do a breast cell exam once a month, you find the perfect day, the time you want to get that reminder on your phone, and a cute little daisy emoji will pop up and say, it's time. <laughs> so definitely encourage you to download that, but it's free and accessible for everybody. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for having me today. Um, and I will say my daughter is 11, so I told Betsy that a couple weeks ago, she had her puberty talk with the school nurse, and she came home with a daisy wheel. Um, and my daughter is, like most young women, are you know maybe a little bit um, shy about talking about the changes in their bodies. She doesn't want to talk to me about her breasts. Um, but I was cleaning her bathroom the other day, and I noticed that she has her daisy wheel in her bathroom drawer. So thank you for that. share that similar to Betsy, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer when I was 12. Um, she was successfully treated, she had a great life, um, and then when I was 29 she was re-diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer and unfortunately passed away three years ago. And I'm so grateful for all of the time that we got to have together. And the experience of having a mother with breast cancer was really one of the instrumental things that made me want to go into genetics and really understand how does family history impact the risk to develop cancer? So one thing that Dr. Zarfos mentioned is that 70% of women don't have a family history of breast cancer. But I think one of the things that we don't do a very good job at talking about is it's not just family history of breast cancer that can impact your risk to have a hereditary cancer predisposition syndrome. You also need to know if you have a family history of ovarian cancer. Do you have men in your family that have had metastatic prostate cancer? All of those things can increase your risk to have a hereditary breast cancer syndrome as well. And you can't just think about mom's side of the family. Dad's side of the family is just as important. So everyone has the breast cancer genes. I think that's how we kind of commonly talk about them. But really what those genes do is normally they work in our body to help prevent cancer from developing. So everybody has two copies, they get one from mom, one from dad. And when those genes are working properly, they actually help to regulate the way the cells in your body grow and divide. So they keep that process happening in a really regimented way. You might know that cancer is what happens when our cells start to grow and divide out of control. So if we're born with two healthy working copies of those genes, the way a cancer forms is that over time, through random events, things like environmental exposures, lifestyle factors, the aging process, both of those genes become damaged, or what we call mutated. And when that happens, the cell has kind of lost that regulatory information. It starts to grow and divide out of control, which can form a tumor, which can eventually form into a cancer. 
So when we talk about people having the breast cancer gene, really what we mean is that when they were conceived, for mom or for dad, they inherited a copy of one of those genes that's already mutated. So the sort of blueprint for their body becomes one healthy working copy, one non-working copy in every cell. So they're not born with cancer, but they're down one line of defense. So they have a higher risk to develop cancer and to develop that cancer at a much earlier age. So it's very important that you know your family history because that is the biggest clue that can tell us whether or not you might have one of those cancer gene mutations. So like I said, if you have a family history of breast cancer, obviously that's very important. We want to know how many women in your family have had breast cancer, how old were they when they were diagnosed, but if you have a family history of ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, metastatic prostate cancer, that's just as important to know and to share with your doctors. Um, and I think some common misconceptions about genetic testing are that it's not covered by insurance. That's actually, in most cases, not true. Most insurance companies do cover the cost of genetic testing. Um, and then if we find that you have a mutation, the goal is to either identify those cancers very early with increased screening for cancer, or to even try and prevent cancer from developing if we can. So there are things that you can do if you have one of those genetic mutations. Obviously, I love when people come to see me, a genetic counselor, to talk about their family history, explore how likely it is that there's a genetic mutation in the family, but your primary care doctors, your gynecologists, they're all great resources for you as well. And if they feel like, you know, this is a little outside my wheelhouse, they'll go ahead and refer you to a genetic counselor. And we can sit down, we can talk about your family history together, estimate how likely it is that there's a gene mutation in your family, talk about testing options, kind of what that might mean, and then impact to other family members. Obviously, we share our genes in common with our family members. That's what makes us related to one another. So this is information that impacts the whole family. What she has to say is more important than I can understand. It's not true. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm here on the panel as a person who was diagnosed under the age of 40. I was 37 when I was first diagnosed. And I'm also a two-time survivor. I was diagnosed the second time at the age of 50. I just turned 61 last Sunday. Um, it's interesting when you talked about um, the 70% because I guess that's where I felt it's the 70% because I had no family history of any type of breast cancer. My mother's brother had colon cancer. And I remember I was a senior in high school, so that was 1979 when he passed away. But that's the only one in outside of my family that I know of that had any type of cancer. But now I just found out that, well, another cousin of mine, first cousin on my mother's side again, he passed away a couple of months ago um, from, I think his was prostate cancer. And then his oldest sister now has breast cancer, and she's, I guess Brenda's about 70-something, because she's the oldest grandchild. Um, so up until now, I was the only one that we knew about that had any breast cancer. And the first time around, my daughter was working, she was five, my son was seven, and um, I underwent chemotherapy, radiation, and I had a lumpectomy, and everything was fine. I mean, I was totally, totally blessed. I didn't have a bad time with the chemo. I didn't have a bad time with the radiation, none of my treatment. And I had a tremendous amount of support, which I know that's not everyone's um, story, but that's where Sister's Journey comes into play as well. But um, I, was, I was fine. And then I think it was maybe about 13 years after that, um, no, seven years, I'm sorry. I, I used to wear, Dawn, I'm sorry, I have to tell a story about Walmart. But I used to wear these rubber inserts in my bra because I was never a big busted person anyway, but 
even with the lumpectomy, nothing seemed to fit right or whatever. So I went into Walmart one rainy day and I dropped my umbrella when I went down to pick up the umbrella, the, the, the rubber thing popped out the umbrella. And I said, you know what, I'm done with those. So I laughed my way out of Walmart. I called my sister-in-law and she was an oncology nurse and we were talking about it and I said, you know, I said, I wonder if I can get implants. And in my crazy head, I kept thinking that um, you had to have a double mastectomy in order to get implants. And then I was like, duh, people get implants all the time. So I called the plastic surgeon and she said, absolutely, you can get them. But what we have to do is put in a tissue um, expander into the side that I had the radiation on, which was the left side, to stretch the skin so it can accommodate the um, implant. So we did that. And I was in pain for, oh gosh, months. And I just said, you know what, I said, that was just God tapping me on the shoulder because what happened was I developed a case of shingles and the shingles settled right where the incision was. So they said, well, we have to take that out. I said, no problem, take it out. So when we did that, um, my sister-in-law said, well, you know, there's other ways you can still get breasts using your own tissue. So she did all the research because that's her expertise. So I followed her lead. We found a phenomenal doctor in Stanford. I actually had my surgery in um, Mount Kisco, New York. But um, what happened was during the pre-op testing for the mastectomy and reconstruction, that's when they found the second cancer in the opposite breast. A totally unrelated cancer. So at that point, um, the surgery was not canceled or anything. What she had to do was she had to bring another colleague on board. Um, so we did all that, and I had my surgery March 8th of 2012. But um, at that point, because I had a son and a daughter and a brother and my mother, I said, we, we need to do this genetic testing. So we had that done at that, that time. I do not carry the gene. Um, so where this came from, and I'm still thinking it's environmental, I just think it's, it's the food, it's a whole lot of things. Because like I said, I don't carry the gene. Um, and to have it twice and to have two totally different unrelated breast cancers, it was, it's still mind-boggling to me. I said, my family, we suffer from thyroid issues and of course we all have a little sugar. Um, on both sides, so, you know, that, if they would have told me I had a cancerous thyroid, I probably could have accepted that better because I don't even have a thyroid anymore. I had to take mine out and it was just, you know, that's, that runs rampant in my mother's side. But again, you know, just being aware of your body and even my daughter, and I know she's probably going to kill me now because I'm sticking her out, she's right there. <laughs> I was 37 when I was first diagnosed, so I've been asking my OBGYN, when should my daughter start getting screened? And she's, I was always told 10 years okay. prior. Well, she just turned 28. So I've been on her for the last year. Um, you need to start getting your screenings. You know, next time you go to the OBGYN, talk to them. And she's the worst patient ever, so I know she's not going to volunteer because she's over 18. I can't go with her anymore, so um, because we go to the same group of doctors, I just put that bug in the doctor's ear. When she comes in, could you please just mention it, you know. And I said, because, you know, this is the time when she should be getting screened. And, um, you know, I encourage all of her friends and my friends that have daughters and everything to, to do your screenings. And I can honestly say I wasn't a regular person to honestly do it. And when I actually, I found my lump, um, and it was Thanksgiving that year, and I guess my belly was full and I had my hand up my shirt, but I was reading, it was the Ebony Magazine that had um, famous actresses who had breast cancer. And in the article it told you how to do it. So I just started doing it, and I was like, I didn't know if I felt something or I didn't. And then I remember I went to my mother and I said, let me see your fingers for a minute. I said, right here. I said, you And she's like, what? And I said, you feel anything? And she's like, I don't know. So then I, I went to my husband and I said, put your fingers right here. And he's like, I don't know. So the next day, um, 
I happened to have gone to a, um, one of my church members' funeral, and my cousin and I were together, and we were going to go Black Friday shopping. And we got to the mall, and I said, wait, before you get out of the car, I said, no. And I started on button. I said, what are you doing? I said, no, I want, I said, so give me your fingers for a minute. I said, I want you to just press right here and tell me if you feel anything. And she said, oh, what's that? I said, oh, you do feel something? She said, yes. So long story short, I called the OBGYN, and of course, now this is, I felt that Thanksgiving. So now you're running into all the holidays, so all the doctors are taking their vacations, and it's hard to get in. So they gave me an appointment. They said, well, would you mind? And I think everybody in New Haven delivered a baby that day because <laughs> no doctor was available and there was six in this team. So after waiting and waiting and waiting, they said, well, would you mind seeing one of our midwives? I said, I'll see you. I don't care who it is. I said, I've waited this long. So anyway, I went in, and then the, actually the doctor that delivered my daughter, he, he was free. So... They were doing their exam and everything, and both times, I didn't say a word, but they just both went right to it. The first touch was right there. And um, he's like, well, we need to aspirate it. I didn't know what that meant. So the next thing I know, there comes the big needle, and they're trying to draw fluid, and they couldn't. Oh, it's a solid mash. you got to go see a surgeon. Now I'm like, what are they talking about? <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> but anyway, so they sent me actual radiology, and temple radiology actually told me that there was nothing there, that I was fine, go on, enjoy your life. And I told my mother, I said, when we got back to the car, I said, mm -mm. I said, I don't believe that. I just something just kept gnawing at me. But then what happened? My OBGYN sent me at age 35 to have my baseline mammogram done. And I guess once they, that caught up to all of this, they compared everything and they could see all the changes that had happened and they frantically called me and the, here I am now. Everything started to happen. So the things that you start acting with, events such as this are so, so, so very important. Thank you. And Sister Sturgis provides you with a, a self-exam card. There, if you look at the American Cancer Society or Susan Coleman, they say know your breasts, but they don't tell you to do self-exam. Now, I'm pushing 69. I don't know how to know my breasts unless I touch them. So I really believe that this card saved your life, saved many lives in this room. So take a look at it. If you feel uncomfortable doing self-exam, that's okay. Just tell your doctor. But don't listen to them noise that says don't touch your breast, don't know your, your breast. We're not silly little girls. We need to know our breasts and the only way to do is self-exam. The other thing I want to say to you is 70% of, I'm sorry, 15% of breast cancers don't show up on your mammogram. And I want all of you here, if you find a lump and your doctor blows it off or the mammogram doesn't show anything and you still feel a lump, you go find another doctor. Okay? Because there are women in this room that will tell you that that happened. And so, again, you have to stand up to yourself. If you have a mom, get her checked out. It feels so good to make it this far. And I didn't think I could take it so long. There were days I wanted to quit. I said, surely this is it. But I held on. And I watched so-called friends turn and walked away. And it hurt so much I didn't have words to. But even when my days turns to night and nothing seems just right, Lord, I thank you for, for my life, for my life, Lord, I thank you for every victory in you. And all the moments I know it was you who kept 
upsets me. So I thank you for, for my life. And I watch you take my family from there to here. And when times were a little rough, God, I know you were near. And the moments I thought I failed, I was reminded of your nails. So I held on. And if I never live to see another day, there's nothing I would change or take away. I've had so many ups that they far outweighed my downs. Lord, I thank you for, for my life, for my life. Lord, I thank you for every victory in you I've seen and all the Lord, I thank you for, for my life. I realized some didn't make it. I could have been one of the ones who lost my way. And there were times, Lord, I know I almost went crazy. But I'm still here. With my life, for my life, Lord, I thank you for every victory and you I've seen, and for the moments I know it was you who kept me, Lord, I thank you for, for my life, it may not be and every dream has not yet been realized but to see your face one day God I know it's going to be worth it so I thank you for for my life for my life Lord I thank you for every victory in you and for the moments, Lord, I know you kept me. So I thank you for, for my life. My name is Sharon Lawrence. Um, I am a 10-year breast cancer survivor. Um, it gives me great pleasure to present the 2022 Mother-Daughter Scholarship Awardees. First, let me introduce Mr. James Trey Rollins III the recipient of our Yvonne Cooper Watson Scholarship Award. Share his story. 
and has continued to do so. He believes it's important for young people of color to understand the disease and the impact on our community. He states that since his mother's association with Sister Journey, he actually saw how they care and are willing to support breast cancer survivors and their families. During the last 15 years since his mother's diagnosis, he's learned to, that never giving up is the greatest thing that you can do. Thank you, Trey. And we'd like to present you with this scholarship. Linda Y. Epps is also the originator 
of the um, Cal Al Annual Survival Calendar and the Pink Tea. <laughs> Haley tells us that the passing of her grandmother was the beginning of her exposure to patients and various medical professionals. That affected her in such a way that she decided to dedicate her life to service and show devotion to individuals on a day-to-day -day basis by becoming a nurse. She believes that through her work, she will be a constant reminder to patients that there is more to their life than illness. She stated that Sister's Journey is an important organization because women like her grandmother are reminded that they are powerful and invincible and the power lies within them and not within their illness. So Haley, Haley, we thank you and present you with this scholarship. Hi everyone, my name is Holly Bonner. I want to extend a very special thank you to this organization for their support in my academic career at Quinnipiac University. I'm a first year nursing student and I'm looking forward to next year. Um, <laughs> as I will be a RA, and amongst that, I will be heavily involved with Black Student Union and other organizations at my school. Because of you survivors, we are here for you. I'd like to leave with this. We encourage all of you to be advocates of your own bodies. We thank you all for coming out this afternoon. We hope that you all have a happy Mother's Day. But before I am done, I would like for all of the board members of Sister's Journey to please join me at the podium.